today. Um, my first book was called Pointed Sentences. I'm going to read a few poems from that, and then I'll read a few poems from a chapbook, and then uh, finish with some poems from uh, Les Bruno. Okay. I uh, used to live in New York, and uh, when I lived in New York, I taught at a community college there. And um, one of the assignments we were um, uh, forced to, uh, to use in our classes was uh, to have the students write a process paper. Now, a process paper is a how-to paper how to do this, how to do that. And um, over time, uh, teachers have gotten a little uh, uh, smarter about assigning that paper, and we give guidelines now and get better papers. But at that time, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was a pretty good teacher. And uh, so I just had them write on anything they wanted. And it, um, anyway, um, out of my frustration, I wrote a poem called Processes. So this is my poem. Processes, how to boil water. Get a pot, fill it with water, place it on the stove, turn on the flame. When tiny bubbles appear and grow wild, voila. <laughs> how to cook an egg. Read my poem, how to boil water. <laughs> Drop an egg in it. How to eat. Press your food into the hole just below your nose. <laughs> How to think. Pick one thing, one thing you've been told. Pick this one thing you've been told and pick and pick and keep picking at it until the scab of unknowing falls off. How to love. Sweep into one corner all your ego. Set a match to it. <laughs> How to die. Watch those who live in your neighborhood. Watch them closely. Copy what they cease to do. <laughs> um, and uh, since it's a uh, summery day, I thought I'd read a poem that's kind of summer like. Um, and this one is called Fish Boil. Uh, from being in Dort County, you've been up there probably tend to the same fish boil that I do. <clears throat> it's a cheap way to feed 300 people. Hot fire, metal pot, peeled potatoes, raw fish. Control the temperature with a garden hose. Burn off the scum with kerosene. Use giant aluminum colanders. Lift them out with iron rods. Set up a buffet table. Scatter picnic benches over the grounds. Truck in some spicy coleslaw. Provide trays and salt and pepper. If you boil it, they will come. Those in shorts and socks. Those in sundresses, sans brassiers. Those in cocktail gowns. The talk will be of bones and sunscreen and beer and bones. Careful of the bones. You have to protect the bones. Put sunscreen on your bones. Death has an appetite for bones. This poem uh, is called The Tsunami Future. It's a different kind of weather poem. Uh, and it goes like this. Many of my friends are missing digits, but no one I know is missing a limb. That's the nature of fortune. It's incremental. One day, you install a bay window in your house in Fontana Rosa Glen, and the next week you inherit a two-bedroom cottage overlooking Simeon Bay. One day your daughter marries a furrier, and the next day your wife moves to San Rafael. Fortune spaniels after you, and when it finally licks you on the heel, you find that it is made of tar. At long last, your dream has come true. Your future is watertight. The fraying seam of tomorrow has been sealed. Ah, but you miss the risk of rain. You long to get in on the hurricane. And the last one I'll read from Point of Sentences is uh, a poem called She Waited for Him. 
Station after station, she waited for him, and he waited for her. And that was part of the problem, this alignment. But neither understood the geography required for connection, how locus expands, how the Atlantic Ocean becomes Texas. When he held of her, when, when he held her, he thought of Racine. And when she held him, she thought of Cheyenne. Of course, there was nothing in between except for love. But what is love? Perfume worn by saints. So they stock cathedrals for the odor, breathe in sandalwood, candles, holiness, mold. And when their noses were full, they took that to mean they had found it. We all want to believe we found love, but what smells like love may not be love at all. That's the cross. It may just be worship. <laughs> now, thank you. And now I'll read a few poems from uh, my chapbook called Incompetent Translations and Inept Haiku. Uh, and this one is called Rattlesnake Pancakes. I don't usually take bets, but I took this one. Lotto bet me a melamite ring I wouldn't eat a rattlesnake pancake. Normally. I am cautious, but I needed a gift for Emily Beth, and her father, being a miner, she had a thing for melamite. The thing on my plate was the color of a dry scab, and it tasted as vile as it looked. But I got one swallow down, and then 20 followed in slow succession. I felt queasy, but Blotto never guessed. When five hours later I was still alive, he handed over the ring. I ran to Emily Beth's mom's place on Arapaho. I found her sitting on a two-person glider on the wraparound porch. Emily Beth, I got a ring for you. Oh, blister, however did you afford a ring of melamite? That just heats my heart. Maybe so, Emily Beth, but are you tepid enough to wed? A gift is not a liberty blister. I'll not marry you until father life has sucked the selfish out of your soul. <laughs> selfish, selfish. I ate snake poison for you. Yeah, but you didn't die, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so what's the good of that? <laughs> so I finished it. <laughs> okay, um, this is a poem, uh, a series of poems in this book called uh, Translations from the English. Uh, and so this is my version of uh, uh, Walt Whitman. It's called Song of Unself. I cerebrate myself and singe myself. And what you will loom, I refuse. For every good Adam betrothed to you will to me betray. I chafe and incite my soul. I bake and chafe in my disease. My speech, every item of tongue, foams in the soil-free dust. Earth's parents, whose parents, ah, I am now 67, 68, 69 years, chagrin besmears me, increases till death, old shoals in obeisance. Nothing suffices as harbor, but a permit to claw at every yawing chasm. Exuberance is beauty, lesion of enthusiasm. And, uh, the other poem that I'll read from this book is called The Basement of Desire. There's a poem by William Carlos Williams called The Attic of Desire. And uh, this poem really has nothing to do with that except I, I thought I would just play on that title. Um, the Basement of Desire. Sooner or later you realize that all the leftover wood you've been saving, all the scraps of PVC pipe in the utility closet, all the plumbing nuggets you squirreled away, all the used sandpaper, loose roofing nails, railroad spikes, iron filings, copper battery caps, coils of solder, cylinders of tin, carrots of glue, single hinges, tubs of bulbs, nylon cord, bladeless hacksaws, rusted caulk guns, bent nails, blunt screws, broken hammers, brittle gaskets, sleeves of galvanized washers, 
leftover shims, installation kits, cans of mineral spirits, screen door hardware, drawers of squeeze nozzles, noxious solvents, the whole haberdashery of plastic pieces, sheathing connectors, and containers is just a metaphor of shifting meaning, representing sequentially and recursively your childhood, your body, your marriage, and your mind. <laughs> um, and I'll uh, uh, read a few poems from, uh, let me go over a couple minutes if that's okay, sorry, um, from, uh, from Blasphemer. Um, okay. Um, so, um, if you've uh, published a book, you know that part of that process is uh, to get a blurb from uh, somebody, a friend or a colleague, or uh, to send out, you know, asking, begging uh, somebody if they would, you know, blurb your uh, book, you read the book and blurb it. Hopefully they'll read it before they blurb it. I'm not sure that always happens. At any rate, um, blurbs have become increasingly just elaborate and uh, just, I mean, it just sounds like every book, you know, should win the Nobel Prize from the blurbs because you can't believe that, I mean, <laughs> Blurbs are just pretty amazing. Anyway, over the uh, last few years, I've noticed the blurbs have started to change a little bit. And so this book, this poem is called The New Blurb, and it has an epigraph, which is, the old blurb is predictable in its praise and universally ignored. So this is The New Blurb. One, this book touches your heart, but not in a good way. <laughs> Two, every day I thank God that books like this are hard to find. <laughs> Three, to give you a sense of how infectious this book is, after I read it, I felt ill. <laughs> Number four, there's nothing that can be said about this book that hasn't already been said about some other book. <laughs> but this is just the kind of book I never read, and you should too. <laughs> Number six, this book does the work of imagination for you, and it is hard to imagine how it could be any worse. <laughs> Seven, if I truly understood all that's in this book, I would go mad. And I don't have the insurance coverage for that. <laughs> Number eight, I found this book being not hard to write, very easy to ignore. <laughs> Number nine, don't let the fact that the writing in this book is terrible dissuade you from buying it. Support independent presses. <laughs> Number 10, this book proves the truth of the falsehood. Anyone can be right. Okay, um, so let me read a couple more from Les uh, from Humor. Uh, so um, I try to push the uh, envelope a little bit in this book and be a little controversial uh, in the way that I dealt with certain subject matter and also forms. And so some of what I've done is to kind of play with uh, bound homes. And I tried to take found poems and see if they could become formalized. Uh, in other words, uh, found poems or centos, uh, where you take lines from other people's work and see if you could put that into a form, uh, a traditional uh, poetic uh, form. So I'm going to read a couple of, uh, of those. Um, and uh, uh, the first one I want to read is called uh, Hard Crane Pantoum. Uh, and this is the first of a uh, couple. Um, and the letters of Hart Crane, the, uh, um, the poet uh, famous for the bridge, uh, have fallen into public domain. And so I found them online and I just found lines from them and I assembled them into a pantoum, which is a formal uh, poem with uh, repetitions in each uh, stanza. Hart Crane Pantoum, number one. Oh, corn, I have known moments in eternity. My satisfactions are far more remote and dangerous than yours. Life is too scattered for me to savor it anymore. Your figure haunts me like a kind of affectionate caress. My satisfactions are far more remote and dangerous than yours. Oh God, that I should have to live within these American restrictions. Your figure haunts me like a kind of affectionate caress. Meditation on the sun is all there is. 
oh God, that I should have to live within these American restrictions. The imagination is the only thing worth a damn. Meditation on the sun is all there is. Let us invent an idiom for the proper transposition of jazz into words. The imagination is the only thing worth a damn. I pass my goggle-eyed father on the streets. Let us invent an idiom for the proper transposition of jazz into words. My writing is hard deciphering. I pass my goggle-eyed father on the streets. That funeral was one of the few beautiful things that have happened to me in Cleveland. My writing is hard deciphering. Oh, if you knew how much I am learning. That funeral was one of the few beautiful things that have happened to me in Cleveland. One must be drenched in words. Oh, if you knew how much I am learning. Let's write occasionally and be as metropolitan as possible. One must be drenched in words. Life is too scattered for me to savor anymore. Let's write occasionally and be as metropolitan as possible. Oh, Gorm, I have known moments in eternity. And uh, just to uh, try one more of these, um, this is uh, a poem that's a guzzle. How many shadows in your soul? Close your eyes, my love. Let me make you blind as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. The street lamps in the darkness have suddenly started to bleed. The hoarfrost crumbles in the sun like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. The sick grapes on the chair by the bed, the silk obscure leaves, taste, oh taste, and let me taste the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. A wet bird walks on the lawn like a needle, steadfastly. See the laburnum, shivering like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. I, who am substance of shadow, I, all compact, I own that some of me is dead tonight as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. My beautiful, lonely body, tired and unsatisfied. I wish I bore it more patiently, as dolphins that leap from the sea, as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. She bade me follow to her garden, where death has delivered us utterly, full of disappointment and of rain, as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. Further down the valley, the clustered tombstones recede, my soul lies helpless as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. The thought of the lipless voice of the Father shakes me with filigree and uncanny cold like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. The angel of judgment has departed again to the nearness, but surely my soul's best dream is still the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. You are strong and passive and beautiful. I will give you all my keys, you with your face all rich like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. And I want to finish with uh, a new poem. Um, I've been uh, playing with uh, the book of Job and uh, I've taken some lines from the book of Job and uh, put them in a different context and so uh, let me end with uh, this poem. Uh, the title comes from the book of Job and, and a number of lines in it uh, as well. Um, it's called Blackish by Reason of the Ice. I was in the basement. I was in the basement with Sarah, who was reading Job to the baby. I was standing in the basement thinking about Uncle Kermit's terrible black tie. 100% polyester, which he wore to the funeral last Tuesday. I was in the basement with Sarah, whose eyes were eyes of flesh, whose eyes were like the eyelids of mourning, who had made a covenant with mine eyes. And I said to her, Sarah, do you take it then with your eyes? And she said, what? And I said, do you take it then with your eyes? And she said, stop being stupid. Can you hold a baby? And I said, I had not been as infants, which never saw light. And she said, sharpening her eyes upon me, take the fucking baby. And I took the baby, and I rocked the baby, and the baby rocked me. And as I comforted my son, 
and as my son comforted me. I remembered they called Edward Dahlberg the Job of American letters because he suffered in his art. Many there are who work hard and suffer neglect. All of Job's? Sarah, I called. Do you take it with your eyes? But she was lost, lost in the text, and heard me not. And then, for just a moment, I too felt lost, like a child, like someone who meets with darkness in the daytime and gropes in the midday as in the night. Of course, I knew we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness alone, any more than Uncle Kermit could have worn a different tie to the wake. For life is wind, and death is astonishment. Sarah, I implored, take the baby, for he hath made me weary. And Sarah took the baby with her eyes.